Okay, instantaneous rate of change. The, the best lesson in high school. Absolutely the best lesson in high school. It, it might be easy at this point through math of the, uh, all the way to have this massive disconnect where you're like, I'm typing in all these things and X's and piecewise and functions and all that kind of stuff. How can anybody use this stuff to actually do anything? Like to actually do calculations. How does this stuff turn into iPhones and cars and skyscrapers and all that kind of stuff? There's a, there's a huge disconnect there. This lesson maybe just gives you a tip on if we just take what you have and just modify it just a little bit, all of a sudden we can solve unbelievable problems with the really intelligent mathematics that's available. Let me tell you about a, a problem, and I'll try and frame it in such a way that you go, okay, I see what you're saying, and then maybe we, we can get to this lesson. Let's imagine I'm going away this weekend, driving away somewhere. I'm not going anywhere this weekend. I am staying at home this weekend. But imagine you knew I was driving somewhere, and you decided to call me up to find out your mark on the test. You know I'm driving all weekend. You call me up and say, hey, Mr. Todd, just out of curiosity, what's your instantaneous rate of change right now? Well, what rate of speed are you going right now? That would be easy for me if I was driving my car. I'd just look and it would say 105 kilometers per hour. But just for sake of arguments, let's imagine my speedometer was broken. Because most of the time, we don't walk around with speedometers. That's a, that's a unique feature to a car. Most situations, if we want to find instantaneous rate of change, whether it's velocity or anything else, we don't have a speedometer to do the work for us. So imagine my speedometer is broken and I'm like, I, I, I don't know. I don't know, how, I don't know how fast I'm going. And you're like, oh you hang up the phone. Five minutes later, you call me and go, I got an idea. Right from the, what, the lesson you taught me, average rate of change. Here's what you do, Mr. Todd. I'll set a timer for five minutes. You watch your odometer, see how far you go in five minutes. We'll take your distance that you traveled, divide it by the five minutes. That'll be average rate, that'll be average rate of change, but that'll be your instantaneous rate of change. I'm like, what a great idea. Let's do that. So we set the timer. Five minutes. I watch the odometer. I watch it roll. Yeah, and I come up with how much displacement I, I came up with. You call back in five minutes. Say, okay, stop. How far did you go? I say, I went 10 kilometers. You go, 10 kilometers, five minutes. You're going two kilometers per minute. Yeah, perfect. You hang out the phone. You're like, except for one little thing. You call back and say, Mr. Todd, in that five minutes, did you go the same speed the whole time? I'm like, no, I, I, I pulled it to pass somebody, yeah, for a little while there, and then I got sort of caught out in that lane with the trucks there, so I had to roll really fast for a while, but then I slowed back down again. You're like, oh, that, that didn't work at all. The only way that works is if you go the same speed all through that five minutes. Okay, let's do it again. But actually, to make sure that nothing strange happens, let's cut it down to one minute so that there's not this possibility that you're changing velocities in that one minute. I'm like, good, we do it. We go one minute, you know, like, we do the calculation, say, okay, you went 0.5 kilometers, you went one minute, beautiful. You say, okay, did you change velocities that time, Mr. Todd? I'm like, yeah, I did. Some dummy pulled out in front of me, and I had to slow right down, and then I caught right up at the speed again. You're like, ah, okay, no, no, it's a, it's a good plan. It's, it's actually a brilliant plan, but instead of one minute, let's go 10 seconds, yeah? Bang, bang, 10 seconds. We'll just slow that time right down, and what are the chances that I really change my velocity within those 10 seconds. So we go bang, bang. You're like, okay, in that 10 seconds, tell me you didn't do anything strange in that 10 seconds. I'm like, mm, you know, kids, they were screaming and yelling about what movie I had on. So I look back for a second and I hit the brakes and I'm like, oh, you kids. You're like, well, don't do, okay. One second. We're going to give you only one second. What are the chances you're changing your velocity in one second? And there's virtually no chance that I would change my velocity in one second. One second is close enough for me driving my van. We would think, you know, and we'd know as we went through it. Now, is one second gonna be short enough time when you're finding the instantaneous rate of change of some seagull flying through the air? Well, it's probably really short a time. What are the chances that a seagull changes its velocity in one second? Is one second gonna be enough, a short enough time when we're talking about how fast a nuclear blast moves? No, nuclear blasts move really fast. One second isn't even gonna be close to a small enough time. So that's only going to be the only big question of the lesson is, when is our time small enough? How will we know our time is small enough? And in my ridiculous example, you're like, how are we going to know a minute, 30 seconds, one second? How, how are we going to know? And I'll say, I promise, I promise, you'll know. You'll know. Something's going to happen. That's the big result of this lesson. Something's going to happen where you go, oh, that's a short enough time 
to get my answer. Okay, there's the big idea. Then I'm going to do the whole thing again officially here now. So, what do we really need? Instead of my stupid odometer, we need the equation. The equation is key in all this to be able to find the exact location of this, well, in this case, it's a model rocket flying through the air, apparently. And actually, this equation for model rockets flying through the air is shockingly accurate. That simple of an equation will model anything flying through the air on the planet Earth. It ignores, for you physics people, it ignores um, air resistance. So as long as the velocities are small, it's pretty good. It would, it would follow pretty well. This is how they calculate, you know, when someone hits a home run and they go, oh, it went, like two seconds later, like, oh, it went 408 feet. And you're like, how could they possibly know that that fast? It went up in the stands. How, how are they going to know how far? It's almost exactly this equation that tells them, you know, how far this thing would have gone based on its exit velocity and the fact that it's on planet Earth and how tall the batter was. So we're really close to being able to do some crazy math here. Anyhow, this says the height of a model rocket in flight can be modeled by this equation. Shockingly close and real. Okay? Find the instantaneous rate of change at t equals 1. Model rockets do not have speedometers on them. Real spaceships don't really have speedometers on them. We've got to have another way to handle this whole situation. So, it says find the instantaneous rate of change at t equals 1. Here's my plan. We're going to find the average rate of change, just like you were doing. That's why I needed you to do some of that homework. We'll find the average rate of change between 1 and 2 seconds. That should be a pretty good estimate of how fast this thing's going. Its average rate of change should be pretty close to its instantaneous rate of change. But then we'll check. We'll close the time down a little bit just to check if it's a good estimate. And then we'll keep going. And you're like, well, how do we know how far to keep going? You'll know. That's the one thing you will know at the end of this lesson. You'll go, oh, I know how far we have to go. You'll, you'll know that. Okay. The last, the re if you get sort of what I'm up to here, it's a brilliant but simple idea, really. Let's just get it closer and closer until we get the right answer. The rest of it's logistics. How do I set this thing all up to make it happen? So, what you're going to do, and I, I made some room over here in the column here. I don't know if you have room in your paper. You might want a separate piece of paper because this is the part you actually have to worry about in these questions. The plan is pretty simple. The calculations, you got to know what you're doing. Not hard, but you just got to know what you're doing. That's why the last homework was so important. I'm going to find the... In Average rate of change between one second and two seconds. So the two-piece information I really need is over here, h at 2 and h at 1. I'm going to do h at 2 first. So you go to your calculator and you type in negative 4.9 times 2 squared plus 25 times 2 plus 2. I just sub in 2 to that equation to find out what is the height of the model rocket at 2 seconds. And now this is the moment. If you've got to break up with your calculator, this is the time to do it. It's perfect on Friday afternoon. If what happens next does not go well on your calculator, then you know it's time to break up with your calculator and you can do better. And you're going to want, you're not going to want to start this homework without a calculator that can do what I'm about to show you here. I looked around and I saw most people had a calculator that could do this. I didn't really see one that wouldn't handle this situation. I'm having a quick look here to see what's out there. Yeah, I, I see all beautiful calculators. Times have changed. Used to be by the, some people get to advanced functions and about half the calculators, they'll be like, no, that's not going to do. Oh, I'm worried about this one over here from a distance. I can't tell. No, it's good. All the Casio ones are wonderful. Okay. So, yeah, this is no problem. I don't have to do a lecture about calculators. That's the first time I've ever had to do that. Okay, so I just type in negative 4.9. Bracket 2 squared. I've got a squared button. Let's get to know your calculator, know where these buttons are. We'll, look, we'll talk about other exponents in a minute. Plus 25, bracket 2, plus 2. I get, uh, if you've got a great calculator, it might try and do the fraction. You're like, do you want the fraction? You're like, no I, I, no, I actually don't want the fraction this time. And you're looking for a little change button. Some calculators will be a little... FD button with a little arrow in between that you'll have to hit to get the decimal answer. I get 32.4. Anybody else get 32.4? Good? If you didn't get 32.4, then it's like, okay, this is what I got to worry about. The big idea is not really a problem here. Smaller and smaller times. Punching in my calculator is the logistical issue, right? 
Next, h at 1. So I've got to do the same thing, but put a 1 in there, which isn't that tough to type in, but if you really get to know your calculator, what you can do on most calculators is then just use the arrow key and arrow back, backspace over the 2's and make them into 1's. Now, that might not seem like a lot less typing, but you're going to find as we go through this lesson that that actually is very helpful to be able to do that. So you can either do that or not, go back and edit what's there, and I get 22.1. Anybody else get 22.1? 22.1? No? All right. So now we're just doing what you were doing in your average rate of change homework. I want to find the delta H, so I go 32.4 minus 22.1 equals 10.3. The delta T is 2 minus 1. I get that right from my table, by the way. You know, right over here, 2 minus 1. There's the two T values. So this wasn't delta Y over delta X. This was delta H and delta T. I'm getting the delta H's from over here. I'm getting the delta T's from there. Average rate of change, 10.3 over 1. 10.3 meters per second. Again, uh, this was supposed to be meters and seconds. Okay, I, I don't know why these notes aren't being more careful about units there, but. Okay, so what have we done? We want the instantaneous rate of change. We want to know exactly the speed the rocket was going at one second. We're going to estimate that by going between one and two seconds, because how much can a model rocket really change its speed in one second? Yeah, this should be a pretty good estimate. But to be sure that it's a pretty good estimate, let's just break the time down a little bit, just in case it did change its velocity, you know, in, in that time period. And we'll do between 1 and 1.5 seconds. To do that, I need one more piece of information over here. I need the height at 1.5 seconds. So I go back and I go on my calculator and I change those all to 1.5s. My calculator, it's really easy to do that. You just hit 0.5 and you just add it in there. Now, any calculator will do the things I'm doing. But you might need your delete key, you might need your insert key. This is, you know, your, your own calculator, I have to figure out how to, how to type those things in efficiently. Or you can just retype the whole thing in every time, but that sort of defeats the purpose of having awesome technology. I press equals, I get 28.475. Anyone else get 28.475? We'll just compare every step along the way to make sure we're, we're getting the same thing. Yeah. So, I'm going from 1 to 1.5 seconds. So. The 1.5 was 28.475. H at 1 was 22.1. Uh, you see how nice this is doing these calculations off to the side like this. Every time I need something, I just look over and grab it. That's what I'm really teaching you today is the logisticals of setting something like this up. The big idea, pretty straightforward, I think. So I just subtract those two. I think I get 6.375. The delta T is 1.5 minus 1. You'll always find that in the first part of your table. And then divide the two to get my new estimate. This estimate will be better because I've taken the time period and shut it down like this. There's less time for the model rocket to change velocity within that half a second. If you want, it's like changing from five minutes in my van to one minute in my van. There's less time for you to, for velocities to change. And when I divide these, I get 12.75. Does anyone else get 12.75 when they divide that? So what do we think of our first estimate? Knowing that the second estimate will be better than the first one. Was the first estimate very good? Well, it's not bad. 10.3 is an estimate, and the answer is closer to 12.75. It wasn't bad, but it's not that great. So we go again. That's the key of the method. The key of the method is you keep going until you're sure. You're like, well, how am I supposed to know? Don't even worry about that. I'm telling you, by the end of the table, you'll go, oh, I see how you're supposed to know. Yeah? Just see the procedure is like start at some time interval and get smaller and smaller and smaller. If you're really with me, you're already like, I would just start with a really small time interval. Wouldn't that really help here? And the answer to that is a big yes, and we're going to get to all that. But for now, we're building a bigger idea in all this. So. I go, okay, one to two seconds, got an estimate that wasn't all that good. One to 1.5 seconds, got a better estimate, but I don't, still don't know how good that estimate is. So 
So I'm going to cut the time down even more. So I go H at 1.1 seconds and I punch that in my calculator and find all the, change all those 1.5s. I got to use a backspace on mine to change those 1.5s to 1.1s. Yours might have a type over feature where it just, you can just press one over top of the five and it just takes care of it just like that. 23.571. Now I got to tell you, the one thing that has changed is if this method is going to work, we got to keep all the decimal places. We're getting down to now 0.1 second difference in time. We need specific heights. We got to keep every single decimal place if we're going to get answers here. So now 1.1 to 1. So it's just average rate of change. Delta Y over delta X. Delta H over delta T here. 23.571. Subtract the original 22.1. Equals. I get 1.471. Anyone else got their calculator going? And then the time interval 1.1 minus 1 is 0 0.1. And then divide. Don't let me go too fast. The big idea is supposed to be pretty reasonable here, but the logistics are important. So make sure you're asking about the logistics of all this because that's the only thing that can possibly hold you up in this. So my initial estimate was 10.3. My better estimate was 12.75, proving that 10.3 was only sort of a good estimate. And now 14.71 has proved that my first estimate was pretty bad, actually. My second estimate wasn't all that good. I'm telling you, though, life's getting better. And you're like, well, this is going to go on forever. I'm going to be here a year. No. And I got to tell you, in the homework ones, we only usually do three per side. We do what I suggested earlier. Start with smaller numbers. Don't start with one away. That's, that's just asking for trouble that you're just too far away. It's like you asked me in my van over five minutes. Well, you're just asking for trouble when you ask for five minutes that something's going to go wrong. Keep the time interval short, but this is the teaching example. It's just get the idea, and that's why it's so long. So even closer, if 1.1 gave me a good estimate, 1.01 is going to give me a much better estimate. So I go back to my calculator, and I punch in 1.01. I go back. Some people in these questions end up using two calculators at once. I'm not telling you you have to get two calculators, but boy, it's handy when you've got two calculators going at once here. One's got this equation on the screen, and the other one's got your other calculations going on, yeah? You're like, oh, really, am I now going to become a two-calculator person? I don't even like being a one-calculator person, but the answer is, yeah, it sort of helps. 22.25151. Okay, so that's the only thing I want to tell you. Not the only thing. That's one thing I want to... Be clear about, we're going to need all the decimal places. If we're going to break this down to little point oh ones, we need every single little decimal place here. And I go again, 22.25151. Subtract the original 22.1, and I get 0 0.15151. Time interval, 1.01. .01. Subtract 1 is 0 0.01. Now, if you're getting completely bored with this plan, that's good. That was the plan. My plan was to bore you a little bit and go, hey, uh, we got to go through this a bunch of times so that when you go to do it, you can refine the procedure a little bit. Start a little closer than this. Maybe start with these last three intervals. That would be a better choice. Start at one decimal place and work closely there. But again, this is the teaching example to really show you what's going on. So what do we got here? We found out that 10.3 wasn't that good an estimate. 12.75 was not that good of an estimate. Maybe we're not surprised now. A whole half second? Yes, a, a rocket can change its velocity a fair amount in a half second. Then 14.71, 15.15. But do you see what's happening? It's settling down now. That's how you're going to know. When this thing settles down, you'll know you've got your answer. So we'll go one more time, down to a thousandth of a second. And we punch that into our calculator one point. 001, 1.001 equals, here we go, need all these decimal places, 22.115, get back here, 1951. 
do the delta D, or the delta H, 22.115.1951. Subtract the original 22.1, and I get, subtract 22.1, I get 0 0.015. One nine five one. Time interval. One point oh oh one. Subtract one. And then when I divide those, zero point zero one five one nine five one over point oh oh one, I get fifteen point one nine five one. And just for argument's sake, let's say I was heading for a one decimal place answer. We want this accurate to one decimal place, it's at that moment that I'd finally go, oh, close enough. You see, I went from tenths to, sorry, from hundredths to thousandths of a second, and the, see how much little it's changing? It's settled down to an answer. That's how you'll know. When this thing settles down into an answer. Now, if your brain's screaming at you, like, okay, well, you're crazy, Mr. Todd. If you, I'm not going to start way out here at one to two. I'm like, yeah, who would do that? Nobody would do that after they know what's going on. You'd start down here. Most people start one decimal place. Then hundreds, then thousands, and that usually gets them there. But that doesn't always work. If we were using the equations of nuclear reactions here, I'm telling you, a thousandth of a second is not nearly close enough for how fast these things happen. So there's no one rule here on how many decimal places to start with. You just have to go by the table. Start really close, and then get closer to make sure it's good. Realistically, if you're actually doing these, Two should be enough if you're close enough. One to check, one to do it, two to check your answer. I asked for three on the test. The very first question of the test always is, take this fun a function, I'll just give you a function, and a time, and build one of these tables, and do three from each side, just to prove you can do it. Is there more on the horizon with this idea? Yeah, this is called method one. Most teachers who teach this call this method one. I'm gonna teach you method two. Maybe we'll have time today for method two, maybe not. Then there's method three, and then there's method four in calculus. It just gets better and better. You're like, show me method four right now. No, no, that's, that's no good. That would, mess, that would totally mess things up. It would mess up your understanding of the whole situation. Method one is fairly easy to follow with a lot of calculations. Method two is a little more difficult to follow, less calculations, and it just gets better and better all the way into calculus. Okay? Instantaneous rate of change is the question of calculus. Find the instantaneous rate of change. We're always curious about the instantaneous rate of change. Do you have any questions about this method, though? Is it good? Lots of calculations, lots of hands. So that's what I promised yesterday. Yesterday's homework was like lots of thinking, very little writing. This is the opposite. Once you, do, once you start doing these, there's very little thinking, just a lot of writing out of everything that's going on there. Oh yeah, good, what's the answer? What do you see? The average rate of change of height in a very small interval around t equals one has settled into a value. That is, there is very little change in the average rate of change. See, 15.15, 15.19, my estimates are getting very close to something. If you go to the next one, the next one goes 15.191951 or something like that. You can go farther if you want, I'm telling you that this thing has really settled, especially if you're looking for a one decimal place answer. It really looks like 15.2 is gonna be pretty close to the answer. Might it be 15.3? Well, maybe, it might get all the way up to 15.3, but 15.2 really looks like that's where it's settled into. Yeah? Uh, so the instantaneous rate of change is approximately, so at this moment, it's an approximate answer, 15.2. So we're not really held down by the fact that this thing might go to 15.3, but 15.2 is going to be really, really close. First two weeks of calculus, we'll do some stuff that makes it so that we can make this an exact answer where we go, no, it's exactly this number here. In fact, I'll do it on my calculator. I'm not, I'm not trying to mess you up or show off or anything like that. I'm just trying to tell you what the exact answer is so that you see how close our answer actually is. 9.8 times 1 plus 25. It, the, the exact answer is 15.2 exactly if you, do, if you use calculus to do it. Uh, so I want you to look forward to that to know that there is a way to get this exactly. And our approximation is a very, very good one here. And, and they will be very, very good. It's a perfectly legitimate way to do this type of question. I heard a question. What was the question? 
Okay, I'm going to continue on. We're going to turn this into a two-parter. I'm going to take your break at 2 o'clock, and then after 2 o'clock, I'll, I'll teach as long as we think we... Up until the point where blood starts running under your ears, and then I'm like, okay, that's enough. I've jammed enough in there for one week. Now you can have your week off. Okay, just a little more on the big idea here, and then back to a specific example, okay? A closer look at rate of change, the tangent problem. I don't know if you remember in grade 11, you did sine, cos, and tan in grade 10, and then for a moment, I don't know if you covered it too much, you did secant, cosecant, and cotangent. And these all seem like these really mysterious words, like they're just making this up to torture us. Well, I don't know if you noticed in the last lesson, I brought up secant, and there, you'll eventually get to the point in math where it's like, oh, secant. That's why it's called secant. We're on our way to that. And now, tan, tangent, we're on our way to being, oh, well, that's what tangent is talking about. When I hit tan on my calculator, it's talking about the tangent. How are those two things related? Well, we're not quite there yet, but at least the word has popped up again, so you know it's not just made up to torture you. So where did we see rates of change before in mathematics? Where have we seen this delta H over delta T, this delta Y over delta X? Both answers are slope. What we're talking about in these questions, we are talking about the slope. What does rate of change have to do with slope? And I've tried to make it that this is less than dramatic. When you get here, he's like, yeah, you've been saying that the whole time. They are one and the same. Here comes the red highlighter. I almost never highlight stuff in red. And it's not that those things that I highlight in red are that difficult. It's just really important to understand that rate and slope mean the same thing. If we want to find the instantaneous rate of a change of a function, we are really looking for the slope at a particular point. Oh, that, that all gets red. That's like high school red highlighting. That's the one big idea we want to get out of this track, university math all the way through, is that if you want the instantaneous rate of a function, what we are really looking at is the slope of a p function at a particular point. How much is it changing right there? If you're really with me though, you're like, wait a minute, I thought slope was between two points. How can you find slope at one point? That's what I just did. I used two really close points to find out what the slope is at a particular point. If that seems weird, I'll take the last five minutes to talk about the planet Earth. If we look at the planet Earth, let me get a new picture here. And we know, despite what the, some flat earthers will tell you, that the Earth is essentially a sphere. It's a little bit bulged out in the middle because it spins so much and it just sort of has bulged out over the thousands and millions of years it's existed. You know this, right? You know it's curved. But it sure doesn't seem curved, does it, as we're standing here? Like when I drop a ruler on the ground, it sure looks flat. When you look out the window, it sure looks flat. I mean, the only people that really clued in that the Earth was uh, round, and the only way they could really tell was watching a ship. So imagine your, your, your dad goes off sailing, or your mom, dad, and mom are off to explore the world, and they go out and off in a boat. And they go off, and you go, know, bye-bye. Happy sail, see you in a few months. You know, this was a pretty regular thing, actually. People would stay away for a few months. And you're watching, and they're going out into the ocean, and you're watching, and then the boat starts to disappear downwards. You're like, the boat is sinking! If you can watch for far enough, on smooth enough water, a boat will look like it's sinking because it's going over the curve of the Earth. The oceans are all curved around here. Top to sea, you don't see that when you look out the window, do you? you don't, it doesn't seem to curve away like that. But if you go far enough, it matters. And, and sometimes um, people who are uh, shooting those big shells in wars and so on, they have to take that into account because the shell sort of does this around the, the curve of the Earth. So what we're saying is, if you zoom in far enough on the Earth, if you just look right there, you see right there? It's basically flat right there. The curvature doesn't come in until later. And so when we say flat right there, what we're saying about that is, I can draw a line right there that sort of estimates the curve of the Earth right there. That's sort of what the curve is doing right there, and we call that thing a tangent. The tangent is the line that perfectly estimates what's going on here. Here, this ruler right now is a tangent to the Earth. It's essentially going level with the Earth at this particular moment. I know it's not going to be accurate for long because the Earth's going to curve away. How, how far for it to curve away? It's about 15, 18 kilometers, I think, before you really would notice 
like before my ruler wouldn't be a good estimate anymore. If we had this ruler 18 kilometers long, somebody 18 kilometers away would go, oh, your ruler's not on the ground anymore. You know, like it would start to curve away, maybe 18, 20 kilometers away. There, that's my introduction to tangents. If you're sort of like, okay, I sort of get that. That's about right for tangents. Tangents take a while to really get, really get a hold of. Back to here. Hang on a second. Doesn't slope only deal with lines? Yes, that's true. So the real idea here is, the, and I, I almost never use the red highlighter, and here I am using it three times in the same lesson. The instantaneous rate of change of a function at a given point is the slope of the tangent. Now, when we did average rate of change, what kind of line did we use? I had a name for it. C was secant. So this is a big idea, and I almost always put this on the test. My last question is almost always something like, which type of line do we use for average rate of change? Which type of line do we use for instantaneous rate of change? Secants for average rate of change, tangent for instantaneous rate of change. And then this. That's great. What's a tangent line again? And the truth is we didn't teach tangents in here. It used to be in earlier courses, but now we, we, we bring it back in, in grade 12. So let's look at tangents for a moment, and this will be similar to my earth example, and then we'll go on our break. The tangent line. In the graphs of a circle and a parabola, a tangent line touches exactly one point on the graph. For other curves, well, it, see, sometimes people say it's a line that hits the graph only once, and that really is true. It hits it only once. Here it hits only once, and it hits it later, but that's only because the curve was weird and came back. It hits it once nearby. You know, it's... It, it's, it's the ruler on the earth. It's like, what's going on right here? Do the pictures make it clear the slope of the tangent represents how much the function is changing at some point? Let's just imagine that this tangent line indicates the direction your rocket ship was going. And instead of the earth, let's go to the moon where it's easier to take off. Earth is tough to take off of, but the moon is not so, so difficult. If your rocket ship was cruising along the ground here and you just kept going and the moon couldn't hold you because of gravity, this is the direction you'd head off into space at that particular moment, because that's what you'd be doing along the Earth. This indicates the direction you're headed along the Earth. Big ideas here. How does this fit in what we were doing in the previous lesson? The answer to that, let's look at the process of finding an approximation to a simple line. Instead of going some crazy example, let's just do a simple line, not the Earth or anything like that. So, I'm going to stop the video there. We'll go to part two in a minute, and I'll do it algebraically pretty much exactly what I just did.